The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to get started again. Um, so where we stopped, um, I had just played you some of the results of uh, this texture synthesis algorithm. Um, we all agreed that they sounded like pretty realistic. And so the whole point of this was that this gives plausibility to the notion that you could be representing these textures uh, with, uh, with these sorts of statistics that you can compute from a, a, a model of what we think encapsulates the signal processing in the early auditory system. Um, and again, the, I'll just underscore that the, um, the sort of cool thing about doing the synthesis is, is that there's like an infinite number of ways in which it can fail. right? Um, and by listening to it and, and convincing yourself that those things actually sound pretty realistic, um, you actually get a, a pretty powerful sense that those, the, 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 the representation is sort of capturing most of what you hear when you actually listen to that natural sound. Right? Um, and, and for instance, we, we, could, we could design a classification algorithm that could discriminate between all of these different things. Right? But the point is that they could, they, the representation could still not capture all kinds of different things that you, you would hear. Um, and by synthesizing, because of the fact that you can potentially fail in any of the possible ways, right, and then listen and, and observe whether the failure occurs, um, you, you get a pretty powerful method. All right. But one thing that you might be concerned about, and this is sort of something that was annoying me, right, is that what we've done here is we've imposed a whole bunch of statistical constraints, right? So we're measuring, like, this really large set of statistics from, uh, from the model, right, um, and then generating uh, things that have the same values of those statistics. Um, so there's this question of, um, of whether any set of statistics will do. Um, and so we wondered what would happen if we measured statistics from a model that deviates from what we know about the biology of the ear. So in particular, you remember that um, in this model that we set out, there were um, a bunch of different stages, right? So we've got this initial stage of bandpass filtering. Um, there's the process of extracting the envelope and then applying amplitude compression, and there's this modulation filtering. Um, and in each of these cases, there are particular characteristics of the signal processing uh, that's explicitly intended to mimic what we see in biology. And so in particular, the, um, as we noted, the kinds of filter banks that you see um, in biological systems are better approximated by something that's logarithmically spaced than something that's linearly spaced. So we remember, remember that picture I showed you at the start where we saw that the filters up here were a lot broader than the filters down here. All right. OK, and so we can ask, well, what happens if we swap in a filter bank um, that, that's linearly spaced. It's sort of more closely analogous to like an FFT, for sure. instance. Similarly, we can ask, well, what happens if we kind of get rid of this like nonlinear function here that, that's uh, uh, applied to, to the, the amplitude envelope? What, and we make the, the amplitude response linear instead. Um, and so, so we did this. So you can, you can change the auditory model and play the exact same game. So you can measure statistics from that model and synthesize something from those statistics and then um, ask whether they sound any different. And so we did an experiment. Um, so we would play people um, the original sound. And from that original sound, we have two synthetic versions, one that's generated from the statistics of the model that replicates biology as best we know how, um, the other uh, that, that is altered in some way. Um, and we would ask people, which of the two synthetic versions sounds more realistic? And so there's four conditions in this experiment, because we could alter these models in three different ways. So we could get rid of amplitude compression. That's the first bar. We could make the cochlea linearly spaced or we could make the modulation filters linearly spaced, or we could do all three, and that's the last condition. And so what's being plotted on this um, axis, oops, I gave it away, um, is the proportion of trials on which people said that the synthesis from the biologically plausible model was more realistic. And so if, there, if it doesn't matter what statistics you use, um, you should be right here at this 50% mark in each of these cases. Um, and as you can see, in every case, people actually uh, s report that on average, the synthesis from the biologically plausible model um, is more realistic. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's, um, here's crowd noise um, synthesized from the biologically plausible auditory model. And uh, here's the result of doing the exact same thing, but from um, the altered model. And, and this is from this condition here, where everything is different. And you, the ability to hear it just kind of sounds weird. kind of garbled in some way. Here's, um, so here's a helicopter synthesized from the biologically plausible model. <laughs> 
and here's from the other one. Sort of doesn't sound like the, the modulations are quite as precise. Um, and um, so the, the notion here is that we're initializing this procedure with noise. And so the output is a different sound in, in every case that are sharing only the statistical properties. And so the statistics that we measure and use to do the synthesis, they define a class of sounds that include the original, that in fact defines the set, as, as well as a whole bunch of others. And when you run the synthesis, you're generating one of these other examples. And so the notion is that if the statistics are measuring what the brain is measuring, well then these examples ought to sound like uh, another example of the original sound. You ought to be generating sort of an equivalence class. And the idea is that when you are, are synthesizing from statistics of this non-biological model, where it's, it's a different set, right? So again, it's defined by the original, but it contains different things. Um, and they don't sound like the original because they're presumably not defined with the measurements that the, the brain is making. Right? I just mentioned um, to you the fact that the, the procedure will generate a different signal in each of these cases. Um, here you can see the result of synthesizing from the statistics of a particular recording of waves. Um, these are three different examples. And if you sort of inspect these, you can kind of see that they're, they're all different, right? They sort of have peaks and amplitude in different places and stuff. But on the other hand, they all kind of look the same in the sense that they, they have the same textural properties, right? And that's what's supposed to happen. Um, and so the, the fact that you have all of these different signals that have the same statistical properties raises this interesting possibility, which is that if the brain is just representing time average statistics, we would predict that different exemplars of a texture ought to be difficult to discriminate. And so this is uh, the, the, the thing that I'll show you about next, is an experiment that it attempts to test whether this is the case, um, to try to test whether, whether really you are in fact representing um, these textures with, with statistics that summarize their properties by averaging over time. Um, and in doing so, we're going to take advantage of, uh, of a really simple statistical phenomenon, um, which is that statistics that are measured from small samples are more variable than statistics measured from large samples. And that's what is uh, exemplified by the graph that's here on the bottom. So what this graph is plotting um, is the results of an exercise where we took multiple excerpts of a given texture um, of a particular duration. So you're 40 milliseconds, 80, 160, 320. So we get a whole bunch of different excerpts of that length. Um, and then we measure a particular statistic from that excerpt. So in this case, it's, um, it's a particular um, cross-correlation coefficient for, um, for the, the envelopes of, of a, a pair of subbands. So we're going to measure that statistic in those, in those different excerpts. Um, and then we're just going to try to see how variable that is across excerpts. And that's um, summarized with the standard deviation of the statistic. And that's what's plotted here on the y-axis. And so the point is that when the excerpts are short, the statistics are variable. So you measure it in one excerpt, and then another, and then another, and you don't get the same thing. Right? And so the standard deviation is high. And as the excerpt duration increases, the statistics become more consistent. They converge to like the true um, values of the station, underlying stationary process. And so the standard deviation kind of shrinks. All right. And so we're going to take advantage of this um, in, um, in, in the experiments that we'll do. All right. So first, um, to, uh, to, to make sure that, that um, or to give plausibility to the notion that people might be able to base judgments on, on long-term statistics, we ask people to discriminate different textures. So these are things that have different long-term statistics. And so in the experiment, people would hear three sounds, um, one of which would be uh, from a particular uh, texture, like rain, and then two others of which would be different examples of a different texture, like a stream. So you'd hear rain, stream one, stream two. And the task was to, to say which sound was produced by a different source. And so in this case, the answer would be first. All right. And so we gave people this task, and we manipulated the duration of the excerpts. And so the notion here is that, well, given this graph, what happens is that the statistics are very variable um, for, for short excerpts, and then they, they become more consistent um, as the excerpt duration gets longer. And so if you're basing your judgments on the, on the statistics computed across uh, the excerpt, well, then you ought to get better at saying whether the, the statistics are the same or different as the excerpt duration gets longer. All right? And so what we're going to plot here is the proportion correct at this task as a function of the excerpt duration. And indeed, we see um, that people get better as the duration gets longer. So they're not very good when you give them a really short clip. Um, but they get better and better and, um, as, as the duration increases. Now, of course, this is not really a, a particularly exciting result. Um, when you increase the duration, you give people more information. And pretty much on any story, people ought to be getting better, right? But it's, it's at least consistent with the notion that you, you might be basing your judgments on statistics. Now, the really um, critical experiment um, is the next one. Um, and so in this experiment, we gave people different excerpts of the same texture, 
and we asked um, them to, d to discriminate them. So again, on each trial you hear three sounds, um, but they're, uh, they're, they're all excerpts from the same texture, um, but two of them are identical. So in this case, the last two are physically identical excerpts of, for instance, rain, and the first one is a, is a different excerpt of rain. And so you just have to say which one um, is different from the other two. All right. Now, the, maybe the null hypothesis here is what you might expect if you gave this to like a computer algorithm that was just limited by sensor noise. And so the, the notion is that as the excerpt duration gets longer, you're giving people more information with which to tell that this one is different from, from this one. So maybe if you listen to just the beginning, it would be hard. But as you got um, more information, it would, it would get easier and easier. If in contrast, you think that what people represent when they hear these sounds are statistics that summarize the properties over time, well, I've just shown you how the statistics converge to fixed values as the duration increases. And so if what people are representing are those statistics, you might paradoxically think that as the duration increases, they would get worse at this task. Right? And that's, in fact, what we find happens. So um, people are, are, pr are good at this task when the excerpts are very short, on the order of like 100 milliseconds. So they can very easily tell you whether you're which of the two excerpts is different. Um, and that as the duration gets longer and longer, um, they get progressively worse and worse. <clears throat> and so we think this is consistent with the idea that when you are hearing a texture, once the texture is a couple seconds long, you're predominantly representing the statistical properties, averaging the properties over time, and you lose access to the details that differentiate different examples of rain. So the exact positions of the raindrops or the clicks of the fire or what have you. Why, why should people be unable to discriminate two examples of rain? Well, you might think, well, these textures are, are just homogenous, right? They're, you know, there's just not enough stuff there to differentiate them. And we know that that's not true, because if you just chop out a little section at random, people can very easily tell you whether it's the same or different, right? So at a local time scale, the details is, is very easily um, discriminable. Um, you might also uh, imagine that what, what's happening is that you know, over time, like, you know, maybe there's some kind of masking in time or uh, that the representation kind of gets blurred together in, in some strange way. Um, on the other hand, when you give people sounds that have different statistics, you find that they're just great, right? So um, they get better and better as, as, as uh, the, the stimulus increases. And in fact, the fact that they continue to get better, that seems to indicate that the detail that is streaming into your ears is being accrued into some representation that you have access to. And so we think what we think is happening is that those details come in, um, they're incorporated into your statistical estimates, but the fact that you can't tell apart these different excerpts means that those, de detail, those details are not otherwise retained. All right, so they're accrued into statistics, but then you lose access to, to, to the details on their own. Right. The point is that the result as it stands, I, I think, provides evidence for a representation of time average statistics. So the idea is that when the, when the statistics are different, you can tell things um, are, are, are distinct. When they're the same, um, you can't. Um, and uh, relates to this phenomenon of the variability of statistics in, as a function of sample size. Um, so um, a couple like control experiments that, that are probably not exactly addressing the question you just raised, but, but uh, maybe are related. Um, so one obvious possibility um, is that the reason that people are good at the exemplar discrimination here when the excerpts are short and bad here might be the fact, the fact that, that maybe your memory is decaying with time, right? So the way that we, we did this experiment originally was that there was a fixed inner stimulus interval. So that was the same. It was like a couple hundred milliseconds in every case. And so to tell that this is different from this, well, you, you know, you, the, the bits that you would have to compare are separated by a shorter time interval than they are in this case, right? Where they're separated by a longer time interval. And if, if, if you might just imagine that like memory decays with time, you might think that that would make people worse. So we did a control experiment where we equated the inner onset interval, right, so that the elapsed time between the stuff that you would have to compare in order to tell whether something was different was the same in the two cases. And that basically makes no difference, right? You're still a lot better when the, the, the things are short than when they're long. Um, and we, even, we, we went to pretty great lengths to try to help people um, be able to do this with these long excerpts. So you might also wonder, well, given that you can do this with the short excerpts, well, the short excerpts are really just analogous to like the very beginning of these longer excerpts, right? So why can't you just listen to the beginning? Um, and so we tried to help people do just that. So in this condition here, we put a little gap between the very beginning excerpt and the rest of the thing, right? And we just told people, all right, you know, we're, there's going to be this little thing at the start. Just listen for that. Um, and people can't do that. Um, so um, we also did it at the end. So we put the gap at the end. So again, you get the, this little thing of the same length as you, you have in the short condition. Um, and uh, this is performance in this case. So people are good when it's short and a lot worse when it's longer. And the presence of the gap doesn't really seem to make a difference, right? Um, 
So that you just you, ha you have great trouble accessing these things. Um, another thing that's, that, that's sort of relevant and related um, w was these experiments that, that resulted from our thinking about the fact that textures are normally not generated from our synthesis algorithm, but rather from the superposition of lots of different sources. And so we wondered what would happen to this phenomenon um, if we varied the number of sources um, in, in a texture. So we actually generated textures by superimposing different numbers of sources. So in one case, we did this with speakers. So we, um, we wanted to get rid of linguistic effects, and so we used um, German speech and people that didn't speak German. So this is like a German cocktail party that we're going to generate. So we have one person like this. And then 29. All right, room full of people speaking German, right? And so we do the exact, the exact same uh, experiment, where we give people um, different exemplars of, of these textures, and we ask them to discriminate between them. And so um, what's plotted here is the proportion correct as a function of duration. We've, here we've reduced it to just two durations, short and long. And there's four different curves corresponding to different numbers of speakers in that signal. Right? So the, the cyan here is what happens with a single speaker. And so with a single speaker, you actually get better at doing this as the duration increases. Right? And so that's, again, consistent with the null hypothesis that when there's more information, you're actually going to be better able to say whether something is the same or different. Um, um, but as you increase the number of people um, at the cocktail party, so the, the, the density of the signal in some sense, you can see that performance for the short excerpts doesn't really change. So you, you retain the ability to say whether these things are the same or different. But there's this huge interaction. Um, and for the long excerpts, you get kind of worse and worse. Um, so this impairment at long durations is really specific to textures. doesn't seem to be present for single sources. To make sure that phenomenon is not really specific to speech, we did the exact same thing um, with uh, synthetic drum hits. So we just varied the density of, of uh, a bunch of random drum hits. Like, here's five hits per second. Here's 50. All right. Um, and you see this, the exact same phenomenon. So for the very sparsest case, um, you get better um, as you go from the short excerpts to the long. But then as the density increases, you see this big interaction. Um, and you get selectively worse here for the, for the long duration case. Um, OK, so um, again, it's worth um, pointing out that the high performance at the short, um, with the short excerpts indicate that all the stimuli have discriminable variation. So it's not the case that these things are just like totally homogenous. And that's why you can't do it. Um, it seems to be a specific problem with retaining temporal detail um, when the signals are both long and, and texture-like. OK, so, so what, is it, what does this mean? Well, go ahead. Here's the speculative framework. And this sort of gets back to these questions about working memory and so forth. And so this is what I, I, the way that I make sense of this stuff. Um, and each one of these things is pure speculation, or almost pure speculation. But I actually think you need all of them to really totally make sense of the results. Um, and it's at least interesting to think about. So um, I think it's, it's plausible that sounds are encoded both as sequences of features and with statistics that average information over time. And I think that the features that we, with which we encode things um, are engineered to be sparse for typical natural sound sources, um, but they end up being dense for textures. So this signal comes in. You're trying to model that with a whole bunch of different features that are in some dictionary you have in your head. Um, and for a signal like speech, your dictionary features include things that might be related to phonemes and so forth. And so for like a single person talking, you end up with this representation that's relatively sparse. It's got sort of a small number of feature activations. But when you get a texture, in order to actually model that signal, you need lots and lots and lots of feature coefficients right? in, order to, in order to actually model the signal. And my hypothesis would be that memory capacity places limits on the number of features that can be retained. Right, so it's not really related to like the duration of signal that you can encode per se. It's on like the number of coefficients that you can retain that you need to encode that 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 signal. Um, and the additional thing I would hypothesize is that sound is continuously, and this is critical, obligatorily encoded. All right, so this stuff comes into your ears. You're continuously projecting it onto this dictionary of features that you have. Right, um, and you've got some memory buffer within which you can hang on to some number of those features. But then once, this, once the memory buffer gets, gets exceeded, it gets overwritten. And so you just lose all the stuff that, was, that, that came before. So when your memory capacity for these feature sequences is reached, um, the memory is overwritten by the incoming sound. And the only thing you're left with are these uh, statistics. So I'll, I'll give you one last experiment in the, the texture domain, and um, then we'll move on. So 
Um, this is an experiment where we, we presented people with the original, an original recording and then the synthetic version that we generated from the synthesis algorithm. And we just asked them to rate the realism of the synthetic example. And so this is just a summary of the results of that experiment where um, w we, we did this for 170 different sounds. And this is a histogram of the average realism rating for each of those 170 sounds. And there's just two points to take away from this, right? The first is that there's a big peak up here. Um, so they rated this the realism on a scale of one to seven. And so the big peak that's like centered at like six means that the synthesis is working pretty well, like most of the time. Um, and that's sort of encouraging. But there's this other interesting thing, which is that there's this long tail down here, right? And um, what this means is that people are telling us that this synthetic signal that is statistically matched to this original recording doesn't sound anything like it. Um, and that's really interesting because it's statistically matched to the original, so it's matched in like all these different dimensions, right? Um, and yet there's still things that are perceptually missing. And that tells us that there are things that are important to the brain that are like not in our model. Um, this is a list of the 15 or so sounds that got the lowest realism ratings. And uh, just to make things easy on you, I'll put labels next to them because by and large they tend to fall into sort of three different categories. Um, sounds that have some, some sort of pitch in them, um, sounds that have some kind of rhythmic structure, um, and sounds that have reverberation. Um, and I'll just I'll play you these examples because they're really um, kind of spectacular failures. Um, so here's um, here I'll play the original version and then the synthetic. And here's the synthetic. I'm just warning you, it's bad. Um, here's uh, here's the tapping rhythm. Really simple, but. And the synthetic version. All right. Um, this is what happens if you, uh, oh, well, this, this is not going to work very well because we're in an auditorium, but I'll try it anyways. This is a recording of somebody running up a stairwell that's pretty reverberant. And here's a synthetic version. And it's almost as though like, the echoes don't get put in the right place or something. And that would sound even worse if this was not an auditorium. Um, here's, uh, here's what happens with music. And the synthetic version. And uh, f this is what happens with speech. A boy fell from the window. The wife helped her husband. Big dogs can be dangerous. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so um, in some sense, this this is like the most informative thing that comes out of this whole effort because, um, again, it makes it really clear what you don't understand, right? And in all these cases, um, it was really not obvious a priori that things would be this bad. You know, I actually thought it was sort of plausible that we might be able to capture pitch with some of these statistics. Um, same with reverb and certainly some of these simple rhythms. I kind of thought that that some of the modulation filter uh, responses and their correlations would give this to you. Um, and it's not until you actually test this with synthesis that you realize how bad this is, right? Um, and so this really kind of tells you that there's something very important that your brain is measuring that we just don't yet understand and hasn't been built into our model. So it really sort of identifies the things you need to work on. OK, so um, just take home messages from this, this portion of the lecture. So um, I've argued that sound synthesis is a, a powerful tool that can help us test and explore theories of audition. Um, in that the variables that produce compelling synthesis are things that could plausibly underlie perception. Um, and conversely, that synthesis failures are things that point the way to new variables that might be important for the, the perceptual system. Um, I've also argued that textures are a nice point of entry for real world, world hearing. I, I think what's appealing about them is that you can actually work with, with actual like, real world like, signals in, in all of the complexity that at least exists in that domain. Um, um, and yet work, work with them and, and generate things that, that you feel like you can understand. Um, and I've argued that many natural sounds may be recognized with relatively simple statistics of early auditory representation. So the very simplest kinds of, of statistical representations that you might construct that capture things like the spectrum, well, that on its own is not really that informative. But if you just go a little bit more complex and into the domain of marginal moments and correlations, you get representations that are pretty powerful. Um, and finally, I. I, I gave you some evidence that for textures of moderate length, statistics may be all that, that we retain. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting open questions in this domain. Um, so one of the big ones, I think, is the, the locus of the time averaging. 
Uh, so the, I, I told you about how we've got some evidence in the lab that the, the, the time scale of the integration process for computing statistics is on the order of several seconds. And that's a really long time scale relative to typical time scales in the auditory system. Um, and so where exactly that happens in the brain, I think, is very much an, an open question and, and, and kind of an interesting one. And so we'd like to sort of figure out how to get some leverage on that. Um, there's also a lot of interesting questions about the relationship to, to scene analysis. So usually you're not hearing a texture in isolation. It's sort of the background to like things that maybe you're actually more interested in, somebody talking or whatnot. Um, and so the relationship between these statistical representations and the extraction of, of individual source signals is something that's really open and I think kind of, kind of interesting. Um, and then there's other, the, these other questions of what kinds of statistics would you need to account for some of these really profound failures of, of synthesis. OK, um, so actually, one, I think this might be interest, interesting to people. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about this, and then we're going to have to figure out what to do for the last 20 minutes. But um, one of the reasons I think I, I was requested to talk about this is because of the fact that there's been all this work on, on texture in the domain of vision. Um, and so it's sort of an interesting case where we can kind of think about similarities and differences between sensory systems. And so back when we were doing this work, as I said, this was, this was joint work with Eero Simoncelli. I was a postdoc in his lab at NYU. Um, and we thought it would be interesting to try to um, turn the kind of standard model of visual texture, which was done by Javier Portilla and Aero um, a long time ago, into sort of the same kind of diagram that I've been showing you. And so we actually did this in, in our paper. Um, and so this is the one that, that you've been seeing all talk, right? So you got a sound waveform, um, a stage of filtering, this nonlinearity to extract the envelope and compress it, and then another stage of filtering. And then there are statistical measurements at kind of the last two stages of representation. And this is an analogous diagram that you can make um, for the, this sort of standard visual texture uh, model. So we, we start out with an image. This is like beans. Um, there's center surround filtering <coughs> of the sort that you would find in the retina or LGN um, that's, that filters things into particular spatial frequency bands. And so that's what you get here. So these are, these are uh, subbands again. Um, then there's oriented filtering of the sort that you, you might get by f via simple cells in V1. Um, so then you get the subbands divided up even finer into both spatial frequency and orientation. And then there's um, something that's analogous to the extraction of the envelope um, that would give you something like a complex cell. Right? And so this is sort of local amplitude in each of these different subbands. Right? So you can see here the contrast is very high. And so you get a high response in this particular point um, in, in the subband. So again, these are, this is in the, the um, dimensions of space. So that's a difference. right? So this is an image. So you've got x and y coordinates um, instead of time. Um, but again, there are statistical measurements. And um, the, there, you can actually relate a lot of them uh, to some of the same functional forms. So there's marginal moments, um, just like we, we were computing from, from sound. Uh, in the, the visual texture model, there's an autocorrelation. So that's measuring spatial correlations, which we don't actually have in the, in the auditory model. But then these correlations across different frequency channels. So this is across different spatial frequencies to things tuned to the same um, orientation. Um, and this is um, across orientations and uh, in the energy domain. And so a couple interesting points to take from this, if you just sort of look back and forth between these two pictures. Um, the first is that the, the statistics that we ended up using um, in the domain of sound um, are kind of late in the game. Right? So they're sort of after this, this nonlinear um, stage that extracts amplitude. Whereas in the visual texture model, the nonlinearity happens here. And there's all these statistics that are being measured at these earlier stages um, before you're, you're extracting local amplitude. And that's an important difference, I think, between sounds and images in that um, a lot of the action in sound is in the, kind of the local amplitude domain, whereas there's lots of important structure in image images that has to do with like sort of local phase that you can't just get from kind of local amplitude measurements. Um, uh, but um, at, at sort of a coarse scale, the, the, um, the big picture is that we, we think of visual texture as being represented with statistical measurements that average across space. Um, and we've been arguing that sound texture consists of statistical uh, computations that average across time. Um, that said, I, as I was alluding to earlier, I think it's totally plausible that, that we should really think about visual texture as something that's potentially dynamic. Um, you know, if you're looking at a, a sheet blowing in the wind or a bunch of people moving in a crowd. Um, and so there might well be statistics in the time domain as well that people just haven't really thought about. Yeah. OK. So auditory scene analysis is, uh, is, loosely speaking, the process of inferring events in the world from sound, right? So in, in, in 
almost any kind of normal situation, there's this sound signal that comes into your ears, and that's the result of multiple causal factors in the world. And those can, can be different things in the world that are making sound. Um, as we, we discussed, the sound signal also interacts with the environment on the way to your ear, and so both of those things contribute. Um, the, the classic uh, instantiation of this is the cocktail party problem, where the notion is that there would be m multiple sources in the world. Um, the, the, the signals from the two sources sum together into a mixture um, that enters your ear. Um, and as a listener, you're, you're usually interested in individual sources, maybe one of those in particular, like what somebody that you care about is, is saying. And so your brain has to take that mixed signal and from that to infer the content of, of one or more of the sources. And so this is a classic example of an ill-posed problem. Um, and, and by that I mean that it's ill-posed because many sets of possible sounds add up to equal the observed mixture. So all you have access to is this red guy here, right? And you'd like to infer the, the, the blue signals, which are the true sources that occurred in the world. And the problem is that there are these green signals here, which also add up to the red signal. In fact, there's like lots and lots and lots of these, right? And so your brain has to take the red signal and somehow infer the blue ones. And so this is analogous to me telling you x plus y equals 17, please solve for x. And so obviously, if you got this on a math test, you would complain because there's not a unique solution, right? It, that you could have 1 in 16, and 2 in 15, and 3 in 14, and so on and so forth, right? But that's exactly the problem that your brain is, is solving all the time every day when you get a, mi a mixture of sounds. Um, and the only way that you can solve problems of these, these sorts is by making assumptions about the sound sources. Um, and the only way that you would be able to make assumptions about sound sources is if real-world sound sources have some degree of regularity. Um, and in fact, they do. And, um, one easy way to see this um, is by generating sounds that are fully random. Um, and so the way that you would, you would do this is you would have a random number generator. You would draw numbers from that. And each of those numbers would form um, a, a particular sample and a sound signal. Um, and then you could play that and listen to it. Right? And so if you did that procedure, this is what you would get. Right, so those are fully random sound signals. And so you know, we could generate lots and lots of those. And the point is that with that procedure, you would have to sit there generating these random sounds for a very, very long time before you got something that sounded like a, a real world sound. Right? Real world sounds are like this, or this, or this, or this. Or this. All right, so the point is that the set of sounds that occur in the world are a very, very, very small portion of the set of all physically realizable sound waveforms. And so the notion is that that's what enables you to hear. It's the fact that you've instantiated the fact that the structure of real-world sounds is not random, um, and such that when you get a mixture of sounds, you can actually make some good guesses as to what the sources are. All right, so we rely on these regularities in order to hear. Um, so um, one intuitive view of inferring a target source from a mixture like this um, is that you have to do, do at least a couple things. One is to determine the grouping of the observed um, elements in the sound signal. And so what, what I've done here is for each of these, th th this is that cocktail party problem demo that we saw, that we heard at the start. So we've got one speaker, um, two, three, and then seven. Um, and in the spectrograms, um, I've coded the, uh, the pixels, either red or green, where the pixels are coded red if they come from um, something other than the target source, right? So like this stuff up here is coming from this additional speaker. Um, and then the green bits are, uh, are the pixels in, this, in the target signal that are masked by the other signal, where the other signal actually has higher, higher intensity. And so one notion is that, well, you have to be able to tell that the red things actually don't go with the gray things. Um, but then you also need to take these parts that are green, where the other source is actually swamping the thing you're interested in, and then estimate the content of the target source. That's at least a very you know, sort of naive, intuitive view of what, what has to happen. And in both of these cases, the only way that you can do this is by taking advantage of statistical regularities in sounds. Um, so one example of a regularity that, that we think might be used to group sound um, is harmonic frequencies. So voices and, and, and instruments and certain other sounds produce frequencies that are harmonics, i.e. multiples of a fundamental. So here's a schematic power spectrum of, um, some, somebody, um, of, of what might come out of your vocal cords. So there's the fundamental frequency here, and then all of the different harmonics. Um, and they exhibit this very regular structure. Here's similarly, this is A440 on the oboe. So the fundamental frequency is 440 hertz. That's concert A. Um, but if you look at the power spectrum of that signal, you get all of these integer multiples of that, uh, of that fundamental. All right. And so the way that this happens in speech is that there are these, your, your vocal cords, um, which open and close in this periodic manner. Um, they generate a series of sound pulses. 
And in the frequency domain, that translates to harmonic structure. And I'll, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Hynek's going to tell you about speech. All right. Um, and so there's, there's some classic um, evidence that, that your brain uses harmonicity as a grouping cue, um, which is that if you take a series of harmonic frequencies and you mistune one of them, um, your, your brain typically causes you to hear that as a distinct sound source once the mistuning becomes sufficient. And here's just a classic demo of that. Demonstration 18, isolation of a frequency component based on mistuning. You are to listen for the third harmonic of a complex tone. First, this component is played alone as a standard. Then, over a series of repetitions, it remains at a constant frequency, while the rest of the components are gradually lowered as a group in steps of 1%. Now, after two... Okay, and so what, what you should have heard, um, and you can tell me whether this is the case or not, um, is that as this thing is mistuned, at some point you actually start to hear kind of two beeps, right? There's, this, there's like the main tone and then there's this other little beep, right? Um, and if you did it in the other direction, it would, it would then reverse. Okay, um, so one other consequence of harmonicity um, is, is, and somebody was asking about this earlier, um, uh, is that your, your brain is able to use the harmonics of a sound in order to, to infer its pitch. So the pitch that you, heard, you hear when you hear somebody talking um, is like a collective function of all the different harmonics. Um, and so one interesting um, thing that happens when you mistune the harmonic is that for very small mistunings, that initially causes a, a bias in the, in, your, in the perceived pitch. And so that's what's plotted here. So this is a task where somebody hears this complex tone that has one of the harmonics mistuned by a little bit, and then they hear another complex tone, and they have to adjust the pitch of the other one until it sounds the same. All right? And so what's being plotted on the y-axis in this graph is um, the average amount of shift in the pitch match as a function of the shift in that particular harmonic. And for very small mistunings of like a few percent, you can see that there's this linear increase in the perceived pitch. All right? So the mistuning that harmonic causes the, the pitch to change. But then once the mistuning exceeds a certain amount, you can actually see that the effect reverses um, and, and the, the pitch shift goes away. And so we think what's happening here is that the mechanism in your brain that is computing pitch from the harmonics somehow realizes that one of those harmonics is mistuned and is not part of the same thing. And so it's excluded from the computation of pitch. So the fact that you've segregated those sources then um, somehow ha you know, happens prior to or in, you know, at the same time as the, as the, the calculation of the pitch. Um, here's number, another classic um, demonstration of, of uh, sound segregation that's related to harmonicity. This is called the Reynolds McAdam, um, McAdams Oboe. It's a collaboration between Roger Reynolds and Steve McAdams. So there's a complex tone, and what's going to happen here is that the even harmonics, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., will become frequency modulated in a way that's coherent. Um, and so initially you'll hear this kind of one thing, and then it'll sort of separate into these two voices. And it's called the oboe because the oboe is an instrument that has a lot of power at the odd harmonics. And so you'll hear something that sounds like an oboe along with something that maybe is like a voice that has vibrato. All right, does that work for everybody? So all these things, are, they're being affected in kind of interesting ways by the reverb in this auditorium, um, which, which will, uh, yeah. So, but that, that mostly works. Um, so, um, so we've done a little bit of work trying to test whether the brain um, uses harmonicity to, to segregate actual speech. And so very recently, um, it's become possible to manipulate speech and, and uh, change its harmonicity. And I'm not going to tell you in detail how this, how this works. But we can resynthesize speech um, in ways that are either harmonic, like this. This sounds normal. She smiled and the teeth gleamed in her beautifully modeled olive face. Um, but we can also resynthesize it so as to make it inharmonic. And if you look at the spectrum here, you can see that the harmonic spacing is no longer regular. All right, so we've just added some jitter to the frequencies of the harmonics. And uh, it makes it sound weird. She smiled and the teeth gleamed in her beautifully modeled olive face. 
but it's, 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 it's still perfectly intelligible, right? And that's because the, the vocal tract filtering that I think Heineck is probably going to tell you about this afternoon remains unchanged. Um, and so the notion here is that if you're actually using um, th this harmonic structure to kind of tell you um, what parts of, of the sound signal belong together, well, and if you've got a mixture of two speakers that were in harmonic, you might think that it would be harder to understand what was being said. So we gave people this, this uh, task where we played them words, either one word at a time or two concurrent words, and we just asked them to type in what they heard, and then we just score um, how much they got correct. And we, we did this with a bunch of different conditions where we increased the jitter, so there's harmonic. Finally, he asked, do you object to penning? And I, I don't know why my RA chose this example, but <laughs> whatever. It's, it's taken from a corpus called Timid that has a lot of weird sentences. Finally, he asked, do you object to penning? Finally, he asked, do you object to petting? Finally, he asked, do you object to petting? All right, so it kind of gets stranger and stranger sounding, and then it bottoms out. These are like ratings of how weird it sounds. Um, and these are the results of the recognition experiment. Um, and so what's being plotted is the mean number of correct words um, as a function of the deviation from harmonicity. So zero here is perfectly harmonic, and this is increasing jitter. Um, and so the interesting thing is that there's no effect on the recognition of single words, which is, is below ceiling because these are single words that are excised from sentences, and so they, they're actually not that easy to understand. Um, but when you give people pairs of words, um, you see that they, they get worse at recognizing what was said, um, and then the effect kind of bottoms out. Um, so this is consistent with the notion that your brain is actually uh, relying in part on the harmonic structure of the speech in order to pull, say, two concurrent speakers uh, apart. Um, and uh, the other thing to note here, though, is that the effect is actually pretty modest, right? So you're going from like, I don't know, this is like 0.65 words correct on a trial down to 0.5. So it's like a 20% reduction. And the, the mistuning thing also works with speech. This is kind of cool. So um, here, we've, we've just taken a single harmonic and mistuned it. Um, and if you listen to that, I think this is this, you'll basically, you'll hear the, the, the spoken utterance, and then it'll sound like there's like some whistling sound like on top of it, because that's what the, the, the individual harmonics kind of sounds like on its own. Academic aptitude guarantees your diploma. So you, you might have been able to hear, I think this is the, that's a little quiet. Um, but if you, listen, if you listen again, Academic aptitude guarantees your diploma. Yeah, so there's this little other thing kind of hiding there in the background. But, but it's, it's kind of hard to hear. And that's probably because, it's particularly in, in speech, there's like all these other factors that are, that are telling you that that thing is speech and that belongs together. Um, and um, all right, let me just wrap up here. So there's, there's a bunch of other demos of this, of this character that I could kind of, I, I could kind of give you about, um, I could tell you about. Um, another thing that actually matters is repetition. So if there's something that, that repeats in the signal, your brain is very strongly biased to actually segregate that from the background. Um, so this is um, a demonstration of that in action. So what I'm going to be presenting you with is a sequence of mixtures of, of sounds. Um, that will vary in how many there are. And then at the end, you're actually going to hear um, the, the, the target sound. So if I just give you one, all right, it doesn't sound like, the, the sound at the end doesn't sound like what you, hear, you heard in the, in the first thing. But here, you can probably start to hear something. And with here, you'll hear more. And with here, it's pretty easy. All right, so. Each time you're getting one of these mixtures, and if you just get a single mixture, you can't hear anything, right? But just by virtue of the fact that there's this latent repeating structure in there, your brain is actually able to, to tell that there's, there's a, a consistent source and segregates that from the background. I started off by telling you that you know, the, the, the only way that you can actually solve this, this problem um, is by incorporating your knowledge of the statistical structure of the world. Um, and, and yet, so far, the way that the field has really moved um, has been to basically just use intuitions. You know? And so people would look at spectrograms, and they say, oh, yeah, there's like harmonic structure. There's common onset. And so then you can do an experiment and show that that has some effect. Um, but what we'd really like to understand is, is how these so-called grouping cues relate to natural sound statistics. Um, we'd like to know whether we're optimal given the nature of real-world sounds. Um, we'd like to know whether these things are actually learned from experience with sound, whether you're born with them. Um, the, the relative importance of these things relative to like knowledge of particular sounds like words. Um, and so this, I really regard this stuff as, as in its infancy, but I think it's really kind of wide open. And, and so the, the sort of take home messages here 
um, are that th there are grouping cues that the brain uses to uh, take the sound energy that comes into your ears and assign it to different sources um, that are presumed to be related to statistical regularities of natural sounds. Some of the, the ones that we know about are, are chiefly harmonicity and common onset and repetition. Um, I didn't really get to this, but we also know that the brain infers parts of source signals that are masked by by other sources, again, using prior assumptions. But um, we, we really need a proper theory in this domain, I think, both to be able to predict and explain real world performance, and, and also, I think, to be able to relate what humans are doing in this domain to the machine algorithms that we'd like to be able to develop to sort of replicate this sort of competence. Um, and the, the engineering, there, there was sort of a brief period of time where there were some people in engineering that were kind of trying to relate things to biology. But by and large, the, the fields have sort of diverged, and I think they really need to come back together. And so this is going to be a good place for, for bright young people to work.